How to sell the same thing for more money by making offers so good, people feel stupid saying no. The agenda, number one, why nailing your offer will make you more money than anything else. Number two, why selling to the right people makes you more money. More than almost anything else too. Number three, why you should charge lots of money for the stuff you sell. Number four, how to reverse engineer value. And number five, I have a pretty sweet demonstration that I'll do for you guys. How do you scarcity urgency guarantees to make people want even more and charge more? More, more, double more. More money, good. All right, so let's start here. Why nailing your offer will make you more money than anything else. So this is my, uh, this is <laughs> my big aha moment. So this is me when I was 23. I uh, just signed my lease, super excited. Arms look better there than they do now, but it's all good. Uh, and uh, had no idea what I was doing. I'd never sold anything, I'd never marketed, I'd never gotten leads. I had no, no clue what I was doing. And so I spent $3,000 of money that I didn't have, only at $10,000 at the time, so I spent a third of my net worth on a workshop that's supposed to be a two-day workshop that was gonna teach me how do you get leads. And it was this brand new thing that was on the internet. It was called Facebook ads. It's 2013. I was super early. This is where luck plays, plays a role. So I went to this workshop, and I was there. I didn't have a real business yet, because I wasn't even open. And the guy pulls me aside, and he could see that I had no fucking clue what I was doing. I was like trying to take notes, but didn't even have context to take notes with. And uh, he's like, hey, you wanna know the secret to sales? That's my faint Australian accent. Um, <laughs> he said, uh, he said, Make people an offer so good they feel stupid saying no. And that was actually the first thing that anyone ever told me about selling. And so it changed my life, and so I try to tell as many people as I can. Because if you get that part right, everything else is easy. And I was very fortunate in that I had somebody very early on who told me that. And so I tried to tell it to as many people as I can as loudly as I can. They don't fucking book about it. And so I realized in that moment that I didn't need to be good at sales, good at marketing, or really good at anything, because I wasn't at the time. Uh, I just had to make my offer good enough. And that was when the greatest game of my life began. And so, for those of you who don't know, an offer is what you literally give someone in exchange for money, all right? There's the product, that's the stuff, the market is the peoples, and the offer is the thing that bridges those two, all right? And so it packages and communicates what you do in exchange for the dollars. A shitty offer weakly connects to the market. Very little flow, very shitty. Or, for some of you, if you haven't made sales yet, that might be your problem as well. So here's how you know if you have a shitty offer. Number one, it's hard to get leads. Number two, most people don't wanna buy. Number three, if they do wanna buy, they compare your prices to someone else. No bueno. And here's why. What many people do is they try and just, what many people do is they try and create another, an also ran, right? And what ends up happening is that the prospect makes a price-driven decision rather than a value-driven decision. And so they think to themselves, these two things are the same, I will therefore take the lower price, right? And so we have to fight very hard, or very intelligently, on how to break that, that cycle, all right? And so this is what it looks like when it's wrong. These two are close enough, I think I'll get the cheaper one. Very sad for all of us. A strong offer connects with a big part of the market so that you make more monies. So here, if you make, and I'm gonna show you a cool demonstration at the end of this, but if you can make an offer that the entire niche that you're going after is like, I fucking need this, then you're gonna have a lot easier time getting leads, a lot easier time selling, and a lot of times it's doing more work than your competitors are willing to do. And that is what's going to shift people to a value-driven decision, which is I really want this thing, gosh, it's expensive, but I don't think anyone else could do it. That's where you wanna be because then you can make up your prices. Great place to be in. And the reason it's so important for making money is that when you get this right, number one, you increase response rates on all of your advertisements in whatever way you advertise. And when I say advertise, I mean to make things known. Number two, increase conversions, so think sales. So more people that you talk to will say yes to you if the offer is right. Number three, premium pricing, which means not only will you have more people respond to your ads, and more people say yes, but they'll say yes at higher prices. And when you have more, 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 you make more, more, more money. So, right now, my current return on advertising in my career is 36 to one, that's not a typo. Our portfolio as a whole generates over $200 million a year, and a big part of that is nailing the offer. And so nailing the offer is the single strongest lever on your business success. 
So let me just show you how much. So this was a traditional agency offer that we worked on ages ago, but we just changed one thing about the business model, just the offer. We didn't change any of the mechanics in the business, what they actually did, nothing. We just changed the offer. So what they used to do is they were a generic Facebook ads agency. Who here knows what I'm talking about with that? Anybody? Yes? Okay. You know these ones. Everybody has one. Your mom has one. Your mom's basement has a kid in it who also does it too, right? <laughs> thousand down, thousand a month. I'll run your ads for you, right? There you go. We were doing Facebook ads. You get leads maybe, maybe you don't. You pay us just the same. Pretty generic, pretty shitty offer. And so this is what their actual return on advertising was for their advertising spend. So they're spending $10,000 a month. They reach 300,000 people. Their response rate between impressions to people who click. Um, they got 40 book calls from that. Short was 75%. Appointments who showed was 30. Closing was 16%. Close five. Price point was 1,000. So they spent 10. They made five. So they're making 0.5 to 1. Kind of shitty. But 30 days later, they're at 1 to 1, and then so forth, right? It's pretty normal, and this is actually pretty common in a lot of businesses. Some of you guys may have numbers like this right now. So let me show you a new way. So this is the offer that we changed it to. So rather than 1,000 down, 1,000 a month, we said it's 4K down, one-time setup, no monthly fee, and only pay me when people show up. We'll run the ads for you. And we had an implied guarantee because if no one showed up, you wouldn't have to pay us ever again. Obviously, we're invested in, in getting paid again. We prefer to get paid. And so we will try and get as many people to show up as humanly possible. Cool. Simple. So same initial stuff. Spend $10,000, same number of impressions, 300,000. But two and a half times the response rate. That's more number one. Say, now, because of that response rate, the actual percentage stayed the same. Now, we got 100, though, appointments booked rather than 40, and our short rate remained the same. So now we have 75 appointments versus 30. We would already call this a win, would you not? This would be a win. In your business, two and a half X, cool. But then we got more and more because we closed 2.3 times more people who got on the phone than we were before. But we already had two and a half times more people. Ah, more and more, second more. So we went from five sales for $10,000 to 28 sales for $10,000. More money good. And the price point up front went from $1,000 to $4,000. So we have two and a half time, times the response rate, 2.3x the close rate at four times the price, which resulted in $112,000 in cash collected up front from that $10,000, which is 11.2 to 1, which from a comparison standpoint was 22 times as effective. Just the offer. Didn't change anything else. And so I say this to demonstrate one thing, which is that right now, most of you could dramatically improve your offer and make a fuckload more money. Cool? Fantastic. So if you went from whatever you convinced yourself you're OK with to 10 times better ROAS, would that be interesting to you? Fantastic. All right, so this is what you will get from this presentation. This is the stuff you will learn if you actually do something as a result. Number one, more leads for the same price. Two, more sales for the same call volume. Three, more money for the same stuff. So, natural question is how? So I'll spend the rest of this prezzo doing my best, damnedest, to explain it. All right, so, nail number one. Number two, why selling to the right people makes you more money. So, you want to, see, you want to sell to people who are valuable because of who they are rather than who you are. All right, so I'll leave you a little example. So who here is familiar with conversion rate optimization, CRO? Anyone heard that term? It's basically people who look at your website and say, We'll change a bunch of doodads, and more people are going to click, more people are going to opt in. OK, very simple. In the e-com world, it's more common than in the coaching world. No idea why. When I say coaching, I mean services, et cetera. Um, no idea why it is that way, but it is. All right. Now, so let's say you own that. And you work on an e-commerce business that's doing a million dollars a year. And you have a 10% increase in throughput, which is very common. It's actually on the low end for most CRO agencies. So you increase that business by $100,000 a year. That's value, right? And you charge $36,000 a year to do that. All right, cool, you got a 36% of the value that you added. Neat. Now let's say that you did the same exact work on a business that's doing $100 million a year in e-commerce. Get the same 10% increase. You make them $10 million more. Now you can charge the same percentage of the increase, and you make $3.6 million for that one job. Same work, 100 times the pay. 
Who would like a 100 times pay increase? Yes, me too, I'm with you, all right? And so the big point here is that a lot of people think even the offer itself has to be amazing, which it does. But the next piece of this is to make sure that we're presenting to the right people. So the same work occurred in both of those scenarios, but because this person inherently was more valuable, we get paid more because we created more value for them for the same work. That is leverage. By the way, the definition of leverage is you get more for what you put in. High leverage, put a little in, get a lot out. Low leverage, put a lot in, get a little out. This is a higher leverage play. Having a better offer is higher leverage. You do the same work, you get more responses, you get more sales, higher prices. Is this making sense? Yeah. Cool. So this is a story that I like a lot to drive this point home. So dad buys his kid a car. It's a clunker, looks like this. You can imagine it, right? And the kid's like, I don't know if I want the car. He's like, well, you can scrap it, take the cash, and then you can put it towards whatever part you want. He says, okay. He's like, well, where should I go? He's like, well, why don't you go to the, uh, go to the dealership? See what they'll give you. He goes to the dealership, says, hey, you know, we'll give you, we'll give you five grand for the car. He's like, okay. So he goes back to his dad. He's like, hey, they said they'll give me five grand. He's like, okay. Well, why don't you go to the, uh, the pawn shop down the street, the, the scrapyard, see what they'll give you. Maybe the metal's worth more. So he goes to the scrapyard, has the same conversation, wants to sell the car. He said, we'll give you 500 bucks. He was like, oh. 500 bucks. Goes back to his dad, sulks, and he's like, they're only giving me $500 for the car. He's like, okay. He's like, why don't you go to that, uh, that, that collector thing down the street? You already know where this is going. Goes to the collector's thing down the street. He's like, hey, I'm thinking about selling my car. And they're like, dude, you have a historic blah, 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 blah. That's a $100,000 car. There's only 20 of these left. Comes back to his dad. His dad's smiling because he knows what happened. And the lesson that he wanted to teach his son is if you're not being Hello. It sounded more dramatic that way. If you're not being valued, it's because of the people that are placing the value on you. And so a lot of times, I've, like, we deal with this with a lot of, like, I get into customer segmentation that's beyond the scope of this, this presentation. But if you look at all the customers you have, there are customers that pay you five, 10 times more than your other customers, right? But if you just had those, right? It's a lot easier to make that person more value because of who they are, not even because of who you are, right? And so the person on the other side of the table matters just as much as the thing you're telling them, sometimes more. There you go. The value derived is often about who you find, not necessarily what you provide. And so this is a final little one I'll drive this home with. So there was a guy who was broke down the side of the street. He was super upset, big red car there, lots of fumes. I don't know why I have two car examples, but go with it. And, and uh, guys driving by stops on the side of the road and starts pushing. Has anyone seen this before in their lives? Okay. What's interesting is that this guy, who decided to be the Good Samaritan for the day, helped the other guy out. Nothing crazy, normal thing. When he got back home, he found out that the man on the side of the road was a billionaire, and he had paid off his mortgage, which I think is really cool. It's a real story. And so it wasn't a function of what he did. It was a function of who he helped. So most people could push a car and probably not get anything besides a thank you, which is fine, and that's cool, because they didn't do it for that. But in this particular instance, he got his entire house paid off because of who he chose to serve. And so right now, you probably have pain in the ass clients who fucking suck, and you got a couple of them who are pretty cool. Get more of them. And one of the hardest things in business is being able to say no. But I promise you that if you're able to say no to people who suck, you'll make room for people who don't suck. And those people will pay you a lot more money. Thank you. Facts. <laughs> so, who do I decide to go after if this is what I'm gonna decide to do? Awesome, I'll give you a little framework for this. So when we look at markets that we wanna go after, and this is at a market level, you can actually drill closer to this in terms of customer segmentation. There's four characteristics we look for. Number one is pain, number two is purchasing power. So, do they have the problem to solve? Do they got the money to spend? Can we find them easily? And are they gonna be bigger tomorrow than they are today, right? Because you can reverse this and say, how do I find somebody who doesn't give a shit, can't afford the thing, I can't find them, and it's actually shrinking, right? So let's not do that. Let's do the opposite of that, all right? So anyone heard this? Uh, <laughs> you might have heard this example. So if you have a hot dog stand, right, and you're trying to sell the most hot dogs, so this is going to be a real, we're going to do this live today. If you, you can just shout them out as loud as you can because you have no mic and I do. Uh, 
if you wanted to sell the most hot dogs and we were in a contest and I said, I'll give a, 100 grand to the person who sells the most hot dogs, what would be the one advantage that you would want? Sorry. Sorry. Motherfuckers read my book. <laughs> so normally, I would go through this, they'd be like, the best hot dogs, the best packaging, the best whatever, right? The best marketing. The answer is you wanna be right outside the stadium when the drunk crowd gets out. You want a starving crowd. You can sell bullshit inside of a bun as long as it even resembles a hot dog and you will sell out. And so the idea here is that we wanna find the starving crowd. And the thing is, is that within markets, there are sub-segments that are starving and they're wildly underserved and they have lots of money and just no one has done a good job by presenting the right offer to them. Number two, purchasing power. So a friend of mine actually read this book um, and like was going through this process and he was like, I think I've got my perfect audience. It's unemployed people. I help them with their resumes to get jobs. This is a huge marketplace. It's growing, right? Um, and he gets on the phone with me after like a month of this like crazy great idea. And he's like, you wouldn't believe it. And I was like, tell me. It's like, they can't afford a $300 consultation. It's like, I, I can believe it. <laughs> and I was like, what's the main reason they're giving you? He's like, they're saying they don't have any income right now. I was like, wild thought. <laughs> and so when you're selling something, you want to make sure that the person you have is purchasing power. I will tell you something that I've anecdotally found is that the more I, re I reveal about how expensive something is earlier on in the process, the more money I ultimately make. A lot of people like to hide that and they try to like, you know, obfuscate, you know, trying to like hold it back and not tell people, I don't want to scare people off. People usually have an idea of a range of what something is. And if someone is like so shock value that they won't get on the phone, they're probably not going to close. So I have been, I've made more money. It has cost me more money per call, but I've made higher return on my advertising by having that stuff. But most people are afraid of that because they only look at the front end metrics rather than the back end metrics. So number three is we want to find, find people who are easy, right? And so if they're not aggregated somewhere, it becomes very difficult to advertise to them, right? We can't make our shit known to them if we can't find them, right? If you're trying to reach rich doctors, it's much easier to do that than, I don't know, something that some of you guys are going after. <laughs> like, you got to be able to find this. This is really tactical, but like, this is why I love niches. When you have like associations and Facebook groups and professional services around this particular audience, it becomes very easy to target them. And not only that, it becomes easy to target them across all platforms. And it becomes easy to do outbound to them because you can find those lists. Like there's so many different ways to advertise to them that get easy rather than thinking of creative, innovative ways to do it. Again, there are other ways, but why not make it easier? Like if we're gonna do it, might as well just pick the, 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 the the deck stacked in our favor, right? And so the last one is one that I learned from Uncle Warren, right? Which is, he tells this story that, that has always stuck with me. He said, when I was at Columbia Business School, uh, he and it, he had his closest friend at Columbia. And they were kind of equivalent in every way, super smart, really hardworking, et cetera. And when they graduated, they went their separate ways. He went to get into you know, private equity and investing, et cetera. And his friend went into the steel business and worked really hard, et cetera, et cetera. Fast forward 30 years, his friend did decently well. He you know, rose up in the company, steals a hard business, they can't pay as well, et cetera. This was an American steel, was kind of in turmoil, et cetera. And um, two guys, same IQ-ish, same, same work ethic. Warren becomes an ultra billionaire. The other guy is just a normal dude. And he said, that's when I learned how important it was that it wasn't about how hard you row, but the boat you're in. And so a lot of us are, are rowing in the wrong boat, and we're rowing as hard as we can, but we're actually in the wrong vehicle. And so when we're, when we're trying to pick the market that we're going after, you don't want to pick steel in the US when he was graduating from college. A good friend of mine had a newspaper business. He was a SaaS dude from YC, slick back hair, the whole thing, looked fancy. And he was like, dude, we're not growing anymore. He's like, I've, I've, I've changed the, the offer. I've got, the, you know, I've got my sales team. He's doing all this stuff. I was like, bro, do you want me to say it? And he was like, what do you mean? I was like, newspapers shrinking 25% a year, compounded against you. Not even like neutral, like negative compounding. People are like, 25% a year returns. Like, do that for 10 years the other way, very bad. And so he's like, even though we're gaining market share, I was like, yeah, but the market's this big, right? 
And so the thing is, there's an old VC saying, venture capital saying, he said, when a great manager meets a bad market, the market wins, right? And so a lot of us are trying, we're, we're rowing in the wrong boat. You're pursuing people who suck. If you go to places or you go to markets that are growing, you grow by default. There are some people, this is the nice thing that we have is that we all just went through COVID whatever time ago it was. Who here saw a big increase in their business? Who here saw a big decrease in their business? Well, good for you guys, for everybody else. Um, the point is, is that you actually got to see in real time the difference between markets. Like, the market was actually behind you, and it got so much easier. And so if we have the ability to decide what we're going to sell and to whom, we might as well stack the deck, right? So number one, why nailing your offer is the most important thing that you can do to make more money. Number two, why selling to the right people makes more money. Did I make that point? Cool? All right, number three. Here's why you should charge a lot of money for it, AKA the right price. One of my favorite quotes from Dan Kennedy, charge as much as you can without cracking a smile. <laughs> and so there's three little frameworks I'm gonna give you as quickly as I can, because I wanna get to some of the, the cool other stuff. Um, there's price to value discrepancy. So price is what you pay, value is what you get. This is also a Warren Buffett quote. You can imagine the top line is the value, the middle line is the price. And when your value declines, the point where the price, sorry, the value dives below the price is where people cancel if you have a recurring revenue business or people don't buy, right? And so every single person wants a bargain. This is an important point. You could sell something for $100 million and it could be a bargain. So price has nothing to do with the discrepancy between price and value. There's both variables, right? And the problem is most business owners focus on the wrong side. And so there's two ways you can increase that discrepancy. Number one, the hard way is that you can lower your prices, right? If you lower your prices, you increase the discrepancy. Makes sense, right? It also sucks, because it's a great way to compete on price as a commodity. Remember the apples and oranges? We're doing the apples to apples. Shitty life, right? And what happens is you end up losing most of your money. Oh, I have this nice visual, it didn't come up. Okay, it's all good. The other way to do this is the easy way, right? Is that you can compete on value and create a value-driven decision rather than a price-driven decision. And so this is where we start stacking as many things as we can on this rubber band of value to keep driving it as high as we fucking can imagine so that the price just follows as a result. And so we wanna charge 10 times more than we are now for something 100 times as valuable. I showed you an example of how we could do 100 times more value just by serving a better customer. But does that make sense? This is how you make tons of money, is by jacking the shit out of the, the value so much so that people are like, this is not the same as everything else. I have nothing to compare this to. I have to take whatever number they give me as the only data point I have to compare to. Dan Kennedy said, you wanna sell in a vacuum. No one else is in the room. You're like, it's just you and me, baby. <laughs> I'm all you got, <laughs> right? And so that's what we wanna do in our sales conversations where they have no alternative. There's nothing else that they can do or nowhere else to go or no one else who can solve this problem, all right? And so remember, this is one that's always useful to remind people of. You can only go down to zero. Like you can only go so low on the price, but you can go infinitely high in the other direction on value. So I would wanna tie myself to the thing that I can infinitely go up on rather than the one that I can only compress to zero. So the goal is that they buy a tremendous amount of value at a discount. We still want them to get a deal, but we do it by pushing the other side. The nice thing that happens when you do this, and this is what most people do when they're picking their price. So who here has picked a price for something they're selling recently? Got a good hand? Thank you. By the way, it means the world to me that when you raise your hands when I do that, because it gives me feedback. Okay, so this is what most people do. They look at the marketplace, they look at what everyone else is doing. Number two, they see what everyone else offers in terms of what they're actually providing. Number three, they take the average. Number four, they go slightly below to remain competitive, of course. And then they provide what their competitor offers a little bit more for a little bit less, right? Great value. What's interesting about that is that they're looking at competitors, and the funny thing is, everyone's broke. You might not know this. Most of your competitors, broke. I see a ton of p &L statements every single day that come into acquisition.com. So many businesses, broke as fuck. Don't look at them. They don't know what they're doing. Why would you take the average of the mediocre? Right? Don't look at them. They're poor. Forget about it. Right? 
There we go. That was the, that was the slide I wanted to show you. What happens is when you have a commodity-driven or a price-driven market or offering, you continue to compete on price. And so what happens is everyone offers a little bit more for a little bit less, and they keep going until basically everyone's a nonprofit. Everyone keeps their head barely above water. One month's profitable, one month's not, one month's profitable. Is this, am I telling anybody their life story right now? Anyone? Okay. And it's because you're playing the wrong game. It's the wrong game. You have to be in a place where it doesn't matter what anyone else is charging. Because why would you want to compete with them? Then you have to be compared. Huh. Sucks. No fun. Right? So we want to have a virtuous cycle of price rather than a vicious cycle of price. Because if everyone's doing a little bit more for a little bit less, a little bit more for a little bit less, then everyone can't do any more for any less, which sucks. So this is the better way. I call this the virtuous cycle of price. When you increase your price, your prospects increase their emotional investment. They increase their perceived value when you increase your price. Their results increase as a consequence of their emotional investment. Their demandingness goes down when you charge more. Anyone had the rich client who just says, oh yeah, I sent the wire this morning and then somebody's fighting you over $50? Anyone else? Yes? Of course. I'm a great client. <laughs> I just said money. I might just, don't be an ass. Thank you. Right? When you increase the price, I can't even read what it says. Revenue for fulfillment per customer. You make more money so you can actually do better shit for them. So you actually, in a very real way, get better. And the more you do this, the more your price goes up, the more their emotional investment goes up, the more they value it, the better the results get, the less demanding they are, and the more money you have left over to continue to reinvest in the value you can provide them. It becomes a virtuous cycle, right? And the flip side of that is that you decrease your price, they decrease their emotional investment, they decrease their perceived value because they see you as a cheap alternative, they decrease their results because they don't give a fuck about it, they become more demanding because they're cheapskates, and then finally, you have less money left over to provide value. Is this making sense? Okay, and, but wait, there's more. Your business, when you increase your price, you make way more profit, right? You feel better because you're like, I'm a good business person. I make money, I'm good at this game, right? So you increase your, you, you increase your profit, you increase how much you feel about yourself. Your perception of impact because of the results goes up because you're like, I'm doing good in the world. Not only am I making more money, am I good at business, I'm actually helping people because I have profit left over to actually invest in the value, right? Now. Our service level increases because the people that I can attract as a result, right? Because you can pay more people, like from a Layla's thing. And we have sales team conviction. And this is actually a really underrated one. I've trained a lot of sales teams in my life. The one thing that trumps all training is belief. And if they believe the heart of the founder, the heart of the CEO, is to actually help the people that you are selling to, they will sell with a completely different frame. The best salesperson that we had in our, in our company at Gym Launcher, we still have. I have heard his calls. The man is a savage, like, board, like psychopath. <laughs> Love you. I've heard him on calls after like the third or fourth objection, and he'll just take his, take his hat off, and he'll rub his eyes, and he's like, I'm not giving up on you, Dan. He's like, I, I know you need this. I know you got a lot of stuff that's, that's, that's preventing you. He's like, but I know that this is the thing that you need to get to where you want to go. He's like, so let's, let's keep talking through it. Let's figure this out, man. He's like, there's only one way that your life's going to change is through us. Like, I, I know everyone else's stuff. I know you got no other options. Like, I'm your guy, so let's make this work. And like, I have seen him do this again and again. Now, how many people on your sales team, after they get one objection, they're like, no, 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 you should, yeah, yeah, think about it. Right? Because they don't believe. Because if they really believed, this is, a, this is a really good example. So let's say that you could go back in time to yourself and give yourself one investing tip. Just one. 10 years ago. There's probably a stock or a thing or whatever that was really small then, would be really big now, probably change your life, right? Think of that thing in your head. Now imagine you go, now but you don't look like you, but you're seeing your old self 10 years ago, and you're like, you have to do this thing, and you can't say that it's you. How convicted would you be to get them to do the thing? They'd be like, no, I'm not really interested. I don't really know any of that stuff. And you're like, dude, you need to do this. <laughs> you're like, come on, man, <laughs> right? The thing is, is that that frame 
is the frame of what good salesmen sell with. Because they genuinely want the person to do the thing to benefit. If you are the cheapest price, and that's not what you built your business strategy around, so I want to be very clear. There is a strategy for being the low-cost leader. Virtually every person who I've heard say that they're cutting their prices to get more customers, that was not the strategy they started their business with. The only way you can start that as your strategy is that from day one, you have a cost-driven culture. You build a tech tool that automates a ton of manual labor. You take labor from overseas exclusively. You have a culture of cost-cutting budgeting like Walmart. That's their strategy. For virtually everyone else, there is no benefit to trying to keep cutting your prices, but there's a very big one for being the most valuable. You dig? All right. Quick one. So they did this science experiment, which I think is really cool, and they presented three wines to blind taste testers. And they said, they didn't say this, they were like, there's a cheap wine, there's a middle price wine, an expensive wine. So those are the three wines, they, people tried them, right? And then after they tried them, they had them rate them. So they said, the, the cheap one tasted like cheap wine, the middle one tasted like medium wine, and the expensive one tasted like great wine, right? Here's what's wild. They're the exact same fucking wine. There is a bi-directional relationship between price and value. People, if you want to, in a very real way, increase the value that people perceive about your product, you can make it more expensive and they will value it more. How nuts is that? It also makes you more money. Right? There's my head, right, blowing up. Which means price itself is a component of value. So the goal is to be so much more expensive that a consumer must pause and think this can't be the same category of solution as everyone else. It's so much more expensive, this can't be the same thing, right? And then it pulls you into another category. So you make a decision or you force them to make a decision in a vacuum, all right? Note, if you have any kind of service, this is more for services, if you have a service where a client has to perform something in order to be successful, then it would follow that the more invested they are, the more invested they'll be, which in turn creates better students and better outcomes. So like if you want to help someone, you have to charge them enough that it would hurt them so that they actually do it. The most, ex the most successful weight loss offer I think of all time, um, I am a little bit biased, was the one that we ran for gym launch. It was called the Six Week Challenge. Here's the shtick. People would come in, we would say, hey, you can lose 20 pounds in six weeks, you put $500 down, if you lose the weight, you get the money back. Everyone had real skin in the game. It was the number one offer for the entire industry for almost five years. Because it was so compelling compared to like a membership or whatever bullshit thing that was out there. And when we did that, we had 78% of people succeed and hit the goal. People were like, oh, it's the shtick that you like, no one hit it? I was like, no, people want to get their money back. The shtick was that most people need to lose more than 20 pounds, <laughs> right? Or when you lose 20 pounds, you look at yourself in the mirror, you're like, I look pretty flab. And you're like, right, you should tone up. We should do the rest of this stuff, right? So that was the thing, but they believed that we could help them because we did. And we got them invested more than a traditional gym membership was. Remember, we're competing against $29 membership. So 500 is very, very expensive. Does that make sense? Think about how you can apply this within your own business to separate and create another category. Right. So when you charge more, you also, as a side note, increase the quality of your prospects, which increases the quality of your product. Like I said earlier with the CRO example, if you increase the prices, it takes all the shitty people out. And then by doing that, you only get people who are smarter, more able, et cetera, and then all of a sudden your percentage of results go up because you're dealing with the right people. Right? Don't have to sell to everybody. So we actually did this with one, this is a different weight loss brand, one of our portfolio companies. They were doing 450,000 a month, five to one ROAS, close rate was 30%, profit was about 150,000 a month. And so we made one change to the business. I looked at everything and I was like, we're just gonna raise your price by 50% and change nothing else. I was like, what about all the other, like, let's just do that. He's like, really? Like that's, that's it, that's what we're gonna do? I was like, of all the levers we have, in percentage likely, I'd already done a bunch of research on other people, their competitors, et cetera, and I was like, I think the price, can, the market can sustain this. Here's what's crazy. Went to a million a month within eight weeks, went to 10 to one ROAS, their close rate went up. 
and their profit almost tripled in eight weeks because people believed that the thing was going to be worth more. And they got better results as a consequence. And they got better people to buy. There you go, so 2.76 or 6.7. Okay, that's why you should charge a lot for it. So making, making offers will make you more money than anything else. Number two, while, making, while selling to the right people will make you more money. Number three, why you should charge a lot of money for it. Number four, how to reverse engineer value. I'm gonna do it on time. Okay, so I'm gonna go over. <laughs> Is that cool? Is that all right? Okay. So, if you're gonna charge a lot of money for it, you might as well make it remarkable. So, this was our Gym Lords event. <laughs> There's 700 people in this room, 42,000 here each. Wild, right? So my dad saw this picture on Facebook, calls me up, and he's like, hey, I saw that event. I thought it was supposed to be like for your really expensive, highest paying people. I was like, it was. He's like, no, the one that was like 40,000 a year. I was like, yeah, it was. He's like, do they know <laughs> that, you're, that you're charging them that money? And I was like, yeah, they're aware. I'm not magically siphoning money from their account. They're aware. Blue, like blue is, like couldn't, couldn't fathom it, right? That's $28 million right there. And so he was like, okay. So I could, this was like a teaching moment, right? So I was like, all right, well, I'll bet you that you would pay me that amount of money too. He's like, what? I was like, okay. So let's say that I could triple the profit of your business, because he's a small business owner. He's like, okay. I was like, and I would, uh, and I could do that. He's like, well, what would I have to do? Like, you'd have to show up 10 hours a week more than you currently do. He's like, okay, I could do that. He's like, well, had anyone, like, would anybody else have already done this thing too? And I was like, yeah, 4,000 people would already have gone through the same process as what I would be taking you through. It's like, how long would I have to wait? It's like, about a year for you to get, I was like, it would be eight weeks for you to ROI, and then 12 months, yes. Okay, well then, you know what we're gonna do? Value equation's awesome, fucking rocks, there's four variables, you gotta <laughs> charge something that's, uh, have a dream outcome that's amazing. You have to increase the perceived likelihood of achievement, which is the questions my father was asking me. You have to do it as fast as you can. You have to make it as easy as possible. If you think about those four things within the value that you're charging, you will make something more valuable. So good, fast, cheap, easy. So how can you make it easier? How can you deliver it faster? How can you make sure it's something they actually want? And how can you increase or decrease the risk that they associate with the purchase? That make sense? Okay. So lots of variables, lots of da. Very fun, there's a whole process to this. Exciting, cool. <laughs> Everyone understand how to reverse engineer value? <laughs> Fantastic. So we got two left, or this is the one left. So here's my quick recap. Everyone understand why making a better offer is the strongest lever you have to grow your business? Yes. Number two, and you can say yes back. Does everyone understand that a big component of value is picking the right people? Say yes. yes. Does everyone understand the direct link between price and value and that increasing it both increases the perceived value and your profits? Say yes. yes. Number four, does everyone understand that value isn't an amorphous word but a formula that can be repeated over and over again? Say yes. yes. All right, last piece is a demonstration. So I said five minutes, there we go, we're good. There we go. <laughs> so how do you use scarcity, urgency, guarantees, bonuses, and naming? There's a lot of other things that you can do to enhance the value and get more people to buy your shit. I obviously can't do it in the next three minutes, but I'm gonna do my best to give you a demonstration, all right? So we're gonna do an exercise to wrap this up, and I think it will do more, any, will do more for you than anything I'd say with slides, okay? So I'm gonna sell you a book for 100 grand. Cool? Excited? Fantastic, just kidding, $1,000. Here's the directions. The moment you feel that $1,000 of value has been created, please stand, okay? Thank you. <laughs> 100 grand, just kidding, typo. A grand. Let the value building begin. So, I have a really good book, and I will sell it to you for $1,000. Who would like it? Okay, fair enough. Please stand if that was worth it. It's a bestseller. Does that change anything? No? Okay. That's fine. That's fine. I got it. My work's cut out. 
It's my book. One, I got one, two, three, there we go. All right, I'm feeling it, thank you. It's got almost 8,000 five stars. Worth a thousand yet? Worth a thousand, okay, I see you. It's been number one, four, and seven, bestseller for 13 straight months, still. Worth a thousand bucks yet? Maybe, maybe not. This guy 4 x his monthly revenue, this guy reads a book a month, he said that was his book of the year, and he quadrupled his revenue at his business just from reading that book. Worth a thousand bucks? Anyone? Stay standing, stay standing, stay standing. Stand, I'll repeat the directions. Please stand and stay standing if you think the book's worth a thousand. All right. If I autograph the book, do I have my markers? Here we go. We do have markers. So, Right now, there are only six autographed books, including one that I did earlier, in existence. Is it worth a thousand bucks yet? Wait. <laughs> I'll also put my personal cell phone in the book. I have ten. I have ten of these. All right. Get some standing. Wait. I'll also review four of your sales calls, including your sales management meeting, which right now we can usually get a 30 or 50% boost in sales across your organization, and I'll include it with it. Is that worth a thousand bucks? We'll also have my traffic guy, right now we do about 20,000 leads a day across all of our portfolio companies. So I'll have my traffic guy look at your entire funnel, it's usually about a 10 to 11 page write up, we'll look at every VSL, every video, every ad, end to end, and we'll give you the whole write up, everything you can do to get more traffic in, which normally will more than two exit, but I feel confident too. Worth a thousand? Yeah. All right. We'll also use my network from Layla's process to find the person in your business that is missing, who is the thing that's going to unlock the growth that you need. Please stand if it's worth a thousand. Fantastic. I'll also spend two hours with you going over your offer one-on-one -on -one, to figure out a way to use all the stuff that we said here, some judo tricks that I didn't share, uh, to make to get you more clicks, more sales at higher prices. Worth a thousand? Yeah. I'll also feature that two hours on my show, which right now gets about 10 million impressions, <laughs> which the ad space sells for about $100,000 an episode. I got it given to me and I said no. Um, but about 100 grand per episode in impressions. So I'll feature you on that show. And that's just for 90 seconds, you'd get the whole thing. Please stand, right. I'll also guarantee you three times whatever you paid me over a 12 month. That's the fine print, over 12 months. Is that fair? Worth a thousand? And um, there's only one book. Not 10. So look around real quick. You can, I can see your heads, you're not looking. Look around. <laughs> Tell you sell a $25 book for 100 grand. So please stand and stay standing. Does everyone understand how you can use scarcity, urgency, guarantees, bonuses, and naming to increase the value of the thing you sell? Yes. yes. Does everyone understand how now you can use this offer stream to provide more value, sell to better clients for higher prices and higher volume? Yes. yes. So great. You can take your phones out real quick.